Retinal laser protocols and practical tips. We have no financial interests, and this video was made solely for academic purposes. We aim to make retinal lasering easy for retinal fellows and ophthalmology residents by highlighting the basic protocols of retinal laser photocoagulation and by providing some practical tips for lasering in challenging scenarios. So let's start off with the type of laser used and its delivery. The commonest laser that we all use is the frequency doubled NDAG laser, which is a green laser with a wavelength of 532 nanometers. It can be delivered on the slit lamp using contact lenses or using the indirect laser optomoscope with a 20 diopter lens. Or we can use endolaser during future retinal surgery, but that is beyond the scope of today's discussion. We'll mainly be sticking to the indirect laser optomoscope because it has a number of advantages like a wider field of view and better visualization in hazy media. The only downside to it is actually the toll that it can take on your spinal health, so you'll need to take care of that. Next, before we actually start doing the laser, we have a number of things that we need to check off. So don't hurry. Check that you've got the correct patient, the medical record number. Go to the advice and see what kind of laser has been advised and for which eye. Next, don't forget to give the patient a little heads up about what the procedure entails and then take their consent. In case the patient has already had a previous session of laser, do check the funders before starting laser because some of them can have an exaggerated response to the previous session in the form of massive choroidal detachment and in that case you might need to defer laser. Once all this is out of the way, we need to check the equipment. So ensure that all the cables are connected, provide protective glasses to everyone else who's in the room, and then set your parameters. Always start off with the lowest parameter settings and then titrate as and when needed. For example, when you move from the posterior to the anterior retina, you might need to decrease the power. When there's an area of media opacity, you might need to increase the power. So what are the standard parameters for the four main kinds of laser that we do? You can go through this table at your own convenience. What's important is that PRP and sectoral laser have similar parameters and barrage as well. Focal and grid laser are of course done near the macula so the parameters are always less in them. If you're using an indirect laser ophthalmoscope, the spot size is constant and ranges between 300 to 500 microns. The end point of laser is the intensity of burn that you want. And the burn intensity is dependent on three things. It's directly proportional to the duration of laser and the power of laser, and it's indirectly proportional to the spot size. So we'll be discussing the following types of lasers, panretinal, sectoral, focal, grid, and barrage. So let's start off with panretinal photocoagulation or PRP. As we know, it's commonly done in proliferative diabetic retinopathy and it's done in three settings in any order. So for one setting, you do the nasal retina, leaving a gap of around one disc diameter from the optic disc edge. For another setting, you can do the superior and the inferior retina together, but staying outside the vascular edges. And then another setting, you fill up the temporal retina, keeping a gap of two disc diameters from the foveal edge. Now each setting involves around 600 to 800 burns, making it a total of 1800 to 2400 burns for a complete three session PRP. The burns need to go anteriorly at least till the equator, if not more. So now for some practical tips in PRP. Before starting laser, it's a good idea to note the macula first, just to orient yourself. In patients prone to vitreous hemorrhage, start off with the inferior retina. 
because if there's any hemorrhage, it's going to collect below and then preclude lasering the inferior half of retina. Horizontal meridians have the ciliary nerves and so lasering in those areas may be painful. Better to reduce the power and do it towards the end of your laser. In areas with dense vitreous hemorrhage, you might need to increase the power. Another option is to use a red wavelength laser. Now, we also need to be careful to avoid lasering over certain areas. These include retinal hemorrhages, major retinal vessels, retinal scars, the papillomacular macular bundle, NVD or NVE, and areas of traction. What is the indication for a fill-in PRP? We need to do a fill-in PRP when there is persistent or progressive neovascularization even after having completed three settings of PRP. How do you know that? So you'll see that patients will have active tufts of new vessels and they will not have regressed. They might even get newer areas of neovascularization. There might be fresh vitreous hemorrhage. And of course, there might be areas where there's a lot of gap between the laser spots that escape areas Laser marks may be deficient either anteriorly or posteriorly. When doing fill in PRP, these are the areas that you need to pay attention to. So, cover the skip areas, the areas having new NVEs. Posteriorly, you go as close to the arcades as possible, and anteriorly between the equator and up to the aura. If it's extensive, then it can be done in two settings. Sectoral laser is nothing but scatter laser in one quadrant of the retina. Its parameters are the same as PRP. It's done in conditions that have localized new vessels, for example, retinal vein occlusion, retinopathy of prematurity, vasculitis, and radiation retinopathy. Ideally, it should be done under FFA guidance. So this is a patient with retinal vein occlusion. Fundus fluorescein and geography shows us the areas of new vessels and the capillary non-perfusion areas, and that helps us in placing the laser marks. Now we move on to the macular lasers. As per the ETTRS protocol, direct or focal laser and grid laser both result in a 50% reduction in the risk of moderate visual loss in diabetics. Of course, they have their disadvantages because they lie so close to the fovea. So any kind of expansion in the laser scars would encroach on fixation resulting in central vision loss. Direct laser is what we commonly refer to as focal laser. The main indication is focal macular edema in diabetics where the leak is from a single or a group of microaneurysms. Another indication is of course focal leaks that are away from the fovea in central serous retinopathy. Now the goal of focal laser is to directly treat the leaks. So we treat all the lesions that lie within two disc diameters of the macular center, ensuring that we stay at least 500 microns away from the fovea. In patients where the vision is lower than 2040 and there's persistent edema, we can go up to 300 microns from the center. Grid laser is done in diffuse type of diabetic macular edema where the leakage is from dilated capillaries and not microaneurysms. The pattern of laser is C-shaped going up to 3000 to 3500 microns away from the center of the macula. Of course, no burns are placed as usual within 500 microns of the disc or the fovea. Now, whether we do a focal laser or a grid laser, in any kind of macular laser, it's important to localize the fovea first. If there are clumps of microaneurysms, either you can use multiple 50 micron hits or you can also use a larger spot size. Any treatment over the papillomacular bundle should be very minimal and non confluent. We should also avoid lasering over areas with nerve fiber layer, that is, flame shaped hemorrhages. Modified grid laser is a combination of the previous two lasers. It involves direct laser to all the leaks 
and grid laser to their areas with diffuse leaks. Its main difference from the ETDRS protocol is that modified grid laser involves burns of a lower intensity that is less power and smaller size. Lastly, we come to barrage laser. Barrage laser is the creation of a barrier around a peripheral retinal degeneration to limit or prevent the accumulation of subretinal fluid. The common indications are lattice degeneration, horseshoe tear, retinal dialysis, and retinal holes. Laser marks are placed in two to three rows around the lesion, half a burn width apart. So do we need to laser all lattices? The answer is no. You only need to laser those which have tractional holes or breaks, symptomatic lattices, patients with a history of retinal detachment in the other eye, patients scheduled to undergo refractive procedures or even cataract surgery, lattices with subretinal fluid around them, one-eye patients, family history of retinal detachment in the patient, and atypical lattices like radial lattices which are seen in Stickler syndrome. Asymptomatic lattices, even those with atrophic holes, can just be observed, but of course follow them up regularly. You need to laser them if they have any of the previous risk factors, or the patient is aphakic, pseudophakic, or there is a cuff of subretinal fluid. Barrage laser can often be the most difficult type of laser to do because the lesions can be very anterior. Now, this is a challenging scenario. We have a patient here with multiple large lattices. Do we enclose all of them together like this? No, this is not advisable because if there is a gap in the laser marks, all three lattices would be at risk. Instead, try to enclose each lesion separately. Here we have another challenging scenario where a patient has multiple rows of lattices. In such a case, always start with the anterior most row first. Use scleral indentation and try to laser the anterior margin of the lattice first. If that's not possible, laser it posteriorly and extend anteriorly till the aura. Proceed with the remaining rows from anterior to posterior and try to enclose the lesions separately as much as possible. Here we have another patient with large diffuse lattices extending almost 360 degree. It might look very tempting to enclose all the lesions in a 360 degree barrage, but that's not to be done. Instead, we use a combination of the previous techniques so laser each lattice separately as much as possible going from anterior to posterior. Where not possible, you can also group together lattices. If these lesions are very anterior, another option is, is to do the laser in two settings, doing 180 degree of the retina in each setting and joining anteriorly to the aura. Coming to practical tips for barrage laser. Now we already know that it's very important to laser the anterior margin of lesions because that is where the vitreous adhesion is the strongest. The most common cause of retinal detachment in a barrage laser is because of insufficient treatment of the anterior margin. For example, in this picture we can see that there is deficient laser anteriorly. So this should either have been enclosed completely or at least it should have been extended to the aura. In some patients, for example, patients with Stickler syndrome who are prone to developing retinal detachment, some authors have suggested doing an aura secunda cerclage where prophylactic laser is done 360 degrees, essentially creating a second aura. Patients who develop a fresh lattice near a previously existing lesion, the laser marks can just be extended to the previous old laser marks. Coming to some more special situations, in children and patients in pediatric age group who may not cooperate for barrage laser, it can be done under general anesthesia. Sometimes for very anterior lesions, it may be difficult in pseudophagic patients because of the PCIOL edge effect. In these patients, cryo is another option to be considered.
Patients who have dense media opacity due to cataract, the laser can be done after doing cataract surgery. In patients with proliferative diabetic retinopathy as well as diabetic macular edema, we do two sittings of PRP and then do a macular laser and then one month later we finish the third sitting of PRP. Lastly, after finishing laser, don't forget to advise, explain and prescribe. So advise good systemic control and tell them not to exert or lift heavy weights. Emphasize on regular follow-ups. Explain to the patients that the effects of laser may take a couple of months at least to be seen. Prescribe topical corticosteroids or NSAID drops. With that, we come to the end of our presentation. We hope it was helpful for all of you. Thank you again for watching our video.